I'm a third year student in the Unity Urban Ministerial School. And um, yeah, and, and Reverend Victoria, our minister, is on vacation, a much needed vacation. And I give the message once every three months, and so it's my message time. Um, <clears throat> so the topic today is how can we heal our blind spots of our abundance? And so the first, there's five blind spots, and Maria talked about one of them in her meditation. That first blind spot is that we're separate from our good, our God, our divine. And that we must get it or achieve it or attract it. We must attract their prosperity and their abundance. Or there's a big God out there that if we beseech, 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 maybe they'll hear us. Symptoms of this are we compare ourselves to others for better and for worse. Why for worse? Because the job of the ego is to keep us separate from God and separate from each other. And so you get it, how you say, oh yeah, my problems are bigger than your problems. That's ego separating us. And another symptom is relentless seeking of success strategies. <laughs> know anything about that? What's the fix? Well, to remember what Maria reminded us of, that we are one with God. God, that there's no need to add anything because it's a source of infinite abundance and we can't lose it because it's inside us because in unity we believe we're made in the image and we have a divine part in us. Monday, last Monday, I was driving home. It was a four-hour trip. I'd been to see my nephew and his family and I stopped midway at a mini mart and all of a sudden this blaring thing comes on. Wah, wah, wah. They were saying there was a tornado warning. It was really scary. I got in my car with my beloved dog in the back seat, and I started to get scared and feel all alone, and how am I going to get us home safely? And all of a sudden, I went, wait, I'm the protection of God. I'm the protection of God. And then, divine, and oh yeah, said everybody who's driving, immediately take your car and get under an underpass or a bridge. And divine wisdom said, Honey, look up there in the direction you're going. The sky's clear up there. It's really bad looking here. You better hightail it toward clear skies. And plan B was to keep my eye on the troubled skies. And if it seemed like I needed to find an underpass, I'd do it then. We got home safe and sound. But that's, that's how we forget that ego of, oh, I've got to do this all by myself. Okay? Um, and I'm going to say something. Um, my daughter, Allie, turned me on to this TV series, which is on Prime, and it's called The Chosen. And I, I need to also say that in seminary, Unity was started with a combination of the founders were Christians and New Thought people. And UWM, the big Unity Worldwide... Um, organization, thank you, wants us to go back to our unity roots. And I feel like since I'm in a unity school, despite resistance, I have now fallen in love with the six required Bible classes that I've had to take, and I'm taking advanced uh, manifestation to uh, metaphysics, and they're using Jesus as the way shower. Now, we in unity don't believe Jesus came down to save us unworthy sinners from our sin, Jesus came down as a human who was in touch with God the divine to show us how we can live that life, taking a human journey connected with the divine. So when people ask me if I'm a Christian, I say, yes, I'm a lot of other things. I love Kuan Yin. I've studied Native American spirituality. I've studied the Celtic Druids. Lots of things I love. And right now, it's my job. I'm kind of into Jesus. Um, so I hope I don't offend anybody. Because <laughs> I, 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 like many of us, have been wounded by traditional Christianity. So in this movie, um, Jesus did not rush about to do things. How Jesus performed his miracles of healing loaves and fishes. 
he would just go deep inside and get in touch with what he called God the Father. Now we've evolved. And you can call it anything you want. You can call it divine spirit, divine abundance, quantum field, the universe, the Akashic field, whatever you want to call it, it's okay. I call it God. Um, So the point is that Jesus did not go out and work to do these miracles. He sat quietly, he contacted the divine, and bingo, loaves and fishes, water to wine, healing people. So we need to relax. That's where we need to go to get around that first blind spot. He didn't take no seven steps to success courses. (laughs) Our second blind spot is that money and material wealth Uh, Money and material things are wealth. So the falsity in that is that these are symbols of wealth. And if we worship those, if we think that's wealth, we're disobeying that commandment to put no other gods before me. And we can say the same of other symbols of abundance. Fame or, oh, I'll be okay when I get the love of my life or whatever. The symptoms are we judge success or failure by the amount that's in our bank account, or we give up our authentic self for fame or fortune or money, prosperity. You know, I'll take this job. I know it's against my ethics, but I I need the money. Or we will uh, not be totally truthful. We will be vague or obfuscate or skirt around speaking our truth, or we'll allow ourselves to be disrespected. Um, I I haven't watched this, but I see on TV the ads for what the Playboy bunnies, how they allowed themselves to be disrespected to be on the front page of Playboy. So real wealth, the, 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 the healing of this is to remember that real wealth is invisible and infinite and within me and within each one of you. And that it is how we are in this life. It is how we experience love and joy and freedom. That's real wealth. Decades ago, I was a single mom. My my first husband left when my daughter was two, one or two, one. And um, I kept looking for a partner. I kept thinking, I want I want a father for her, and I want a partner, and blah, blah, blah. She got to be about 13 years old, and I thought, wait, she's almost grown. She's going to be going away to college soon. We're doing just fine. I, I, we're fine. Well, guess what? Within the next year, I met my late husband, Bill, and we had a great marriage because I had to find that wholeness inside myself. And it was God's wisdom saying, you got enough, girl. The third blind spot is that even in limited conditions, uh, that we, we believe that we have to believe to receive. Now, Unity Third Principle does say our thoughts and beliefs determine the quality of our life. So I'm giving you a little bit of an advanced workbook today. So that even if we feel limited, in addition to God inside here, that maybe we feel like we're limited, but God's outside everywhere. And that, that despite limiting beliefs, we can still go forward with our abundance. The symptoms of this belief are waiting, 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 waiting. We have a deep desire to do something in our heart, and we keep getting nudged by the divine to manifest this abundance. And we say, well, I, I, I'm not ready yet. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't feel ready. Or I'm afraid. Or I need to do more research. I need to know all the facts before I start, all the possible consequences. We defer compliments. Why do we do this? Because if we really took them, we'd, we'd, we'd have to take in that we're powerful and strong and capable of manifesting our abundance. And the other one that I want to talk about, the other symptom, is jealousy. And I want to remind us to be very gentle with ourselves when we feel jealous, because do you know what jealousy is? The person we're jealous of is mirroring something that we desire for ourselves. So we use that jealousy as an invitation to manifest that abundance, okay? So um, the healing of this is to ask in order to receive. 
we ha and we have to act in order to manifest. Uh, decades ago, I was in a year-long uh, clinical hypnotherapy study program with a, a, a national guy, a therapist. And so at, at some point, they said, okay, I'd like to, he said, I'd like to demonstrate some of this. Who would volunteer? And several people did. So it got to be my turn, and I sat down. I was a working single mom. I really want a house of my own. I really, I really need our own house. He looks at me and he says, well, go do it. <laughs> <laughs> no hypnosis. No. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> With a shame like that. No. I wasn't so ashamed. I was just kind of hit in the eye. So the, the answer to this is to do it. If it keeps nudging us and it feels right, regardless of our feelings and belief, act. Start one step. Act as if. Yes. I am as if, because when we do that, we build new neuronal pathways in our brains that override those old beliefs. We only have to practice about 100,000 times, but it's not, not too late to start. Uh, and, um, and to remember that life is on a need-to-know basis. Uh, thinking that we need every little detail before we go is only our resistance. I go back again to that... Um, movie series, The Chosen, you know, it, it shows a scene where Peter and Aunt, Simon Peter and Andrew, they've been out fishing all night, and if they don't have a big, big catch, they can't pay their taxes, and the Romans are going to sell their houses, sell their boats, they're going to lose everything, they've caught nothing, they're in deep despair. Jesus comes along and says, cast your nets one more time, and with some doubt, oh, we've been fishing all night, they do it. And the boat's flowing over. In the movie, in the series, they have to jump out of the boat because it's full of fish and it saves everything. But then Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, did they say, what does that mean? Could we have a contract? What are we going to be doing? You know, they just looked into those loving eyes and said, okay. And then <laughs> it shows as they go along because Jesus doesn't tell them he's going to be crucified what are we doing here? We didn't know we'd be out in the wilderness camping out. We never learned how to make a tent. Now we're learning how to make a tent, and there's snakes out here, and, you know, we're eating berries in the wilderness. No, it was on a need-to-know basis. And Matthew says, ask and you shall receive. Why? Because God, the quantum source, the quantum field, life, the divine, is actively seeking to find sources of expression of the divine through us. And if you want to take it more personally, which is, anyway, it's a little bit of a politically incorrect stance right now, but it's mine uh, and others too. Eric Butterworth said, God's greatest joy is to give us that for which we ask. God's greatest joy. So just ask. God loves to give to us. The fourth blind spot is that uh, when conditions contract, we have to contract ourselves. And um, the symptoms are a constricted bank account leads to constrictive actions, or when we hit the wall with a creative project, we just give up instead of seeing it as a challenge for more creativity, or we think that uh, challenges are bad things. The, the cure for that is stretching beyond our comfort zone and looking for opportunities for growth and hang on to our big vision. That's where we are as UCP right now, huh? And guess what has happened? Individually, each of us, and as a community, we've asked ourselves how we need to grow and stretch and meet our current situation, and we're doing it. Uh, uh, sustainers have upped their donations. Some people have doubled their uh, giving amount. And it's a, it's a, it's a great shake-up and wake-up time. Uh, and remember that God... And the God in us is bigger than any problem. Eric Rydell, in the book, tells a story about how when financial times got bad, he started to decrease his uh, charitable amounts, and something felt wrong about that. He said, no, I'm going to double them, and then I'm going to get busy creating ways I can expand my business. Well, at the end of the hard time, his, his income had doubled, 
and he had given lots to charity. So these are the times that we need to stretch ourselves. Um, it does not help it. Okay, so that's blind spot number four. And blind spot number five, this was a big one for me. Money and wealth aren't spiritual. How many times did you hear that verse, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? When I heard that as a little girl and my daddy said it on the way home from church, I thought, is my daddy going to hell? I mean, we weren't rich, but I thought, how poor do you have to be before you can go to heaven, you know? <laughs> I was worried for my daddy. And what we know metaphysically when we interpret that was when this rich young man came to Jesus and said, can I get into heaven? What Jesus was speaking to was his personality that was focused on his fortune on earth and not on his spiritual life. Or how about that saying, money is the root of all evil? Remember that one? Well, that was an incomplete statement. The real statement is the attachment to money is the root of all evil. Now, uh, some things have been, create, been created by some greedy people. I think the railroads, the people who got rich, uh, getting the railroads lay, you know, laid out west and exploiting lots of poor, poor workers, etc. But you know what? Grace and love find ways to serve the world despite how these things have been created. For example, escaped slaves now could take the railroads to the western states where slavery or coming after the slaves was prohibited. Um, and then religion has played a big role in this. Uh, when I was a little girl, well, there's a long history of sacrifice, suffering, and de deprivation are our only means to uh, salvation. When I was a little girl, I was about seven years old, and we were having pork chops for dinner, and I was looking at that pork chop. I was drooling. We said the blessing, and my nanny and granddaddy unexpectedly dropped by right at that moment. Now, I didn't like my nanny very much because she didn't like children very much, and I have a great deal of compassion for understanding that now. But as a seven-year-old, I didn't like her very much. And my mother says, Patty, cut your pork chop in half and give it to nanny. And I thought, it, 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 and I railed a little, and she reeled back, and I did it. And I thought, if this is sacrifice, I'm never going to be a good person. <laughs> Do you know what the real meaning of the word sacrifice is? It comes from the Latin, soccer ficeri, to render sacred. So it's to lift something up, to make it sacred. So how will I render myself sacred? I hope to render myself sacred in giving this message. How do you hope to render yourself sacred in our community with your personal abundance and the, the abundance that you share here with time, action, and Trevor, treasure, which raises the consciousness of the whole world? So how will you do that? The symptoms are uh, we feel guilty when we charge for the worth of our service. Or we treat money badly. We crumple it up. We don't keep it neat and clean. There's lots of symptoms, but those are the two that come to mind. The healing is to remember that real wealth is invisible, infinite, and within me and within you. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came that you may have life more abundant. Now, does that sound like somebody that thinks money is not spiritual? That means an abundance of prosperity and financial, an abundance of friends and good relationships, an abundance of health, whatever it is that we want. And to remember that money is an expression of divine energy consciousness. And whenever we earn it, and grow it, and consciously circulate it, including here, individually in ourselves, in our community, and it spreads to the world and helps raise the consciousness of the whole world. And it's also important to remember that people pay us not by what they think we're worth, but what we think we're worth. Just remember that. And that it doesn't help anything to stay small with our money, with our treasures, with our abundance of everything. 
So in closing, I know we all know this quote by Marianne Williamson, but it seems so perfect to read it, our deepest fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, ta ta talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We, we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within each of us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. It's our it's how we help the world. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So the band is now going to play the gratitude song. And remembering from your meditation with Maria what you wanted to manifest more of, mine is time spaciousness. Um, if you want to get up and move and and get that in your body, and also dance to celebrate. Because when we ask for these things in the no space, no time of the quantum energy field or divine source, it has already happened. So you can dance and celebrate as if you're, because it's already here. Thank you. <laughs>